Thank you for listening to Mormon Sex Info. This episode is an archived episode and is only now becoming publicly available. Mormon Sex Info relies on contributions. To contribute, please visit mormonsex.info. And now, please enjoy this episode. Are you feeling pain that comes with navigating your journey with Mormonism? Natasha will be leading two upcoming events and would like to personally invite you to attend. June 1st through 3rd, she will be in Salt Lake City, Utah, and joined by Dan Weatherspoon, Ph.D., on Understanding and Navigating Healthy Perspectives and Journeys Within Mormonism. June 8th through 10th, Natasha will be in Park City, Utah, with Dr. John DeLynn for the Mormon Stories Retreat, Navigating Life During and After a Faith Crisis. For more information, please visit her personal website, natashaparker.org. And now to the episode. Hello and welcome to another episode of Mormon Sex Info. This is Natasha Helfer Parker and today I am just so thrilled to have Rob Perkins on the show. He is one of the co-founders of the resource that I often refer to these days called omgyes.com and In essence, I'm going to let him talk a lot more about it than me, but in essence, this is a a website that is based in some research, which we're going to talk about, and it's kind of like a one-time subscription, I believe is how it's set up, where you become a subscriber and you have access to all of these videos and informative and educational resources on particularly female pleasure and how to achieve orgasm, how to have clitoral stimulation that is reliable towards orgasm, just so many wonderful resources. And I know that a lot of times we talk about female orgasm from a more clinical perspective. There's all these terms like anorgasmia or uh, delayed orgasm, et cetera. A lot of people are just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do I do about it? (laughs) Or, Or how do I access this particular part of my body in ways that really I haven't been educated about? So I'm just thrilled to have you on, Rob. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Absolutely. It's great to be on. So why don't you tell us a little bit about just yourself, what's your background? How do you get to be the co-founder of OMGS? And especially with, you know, you being a yeah, male. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, absolutely. So that, uh, this was, um, a, I studied neuroscience at Berkeley and did stuff unrelated to sex for a long time. And then a close friend of mine from college and I were in a group of friends that would sometimes speak really openly about sex. And it was always a really exciting conversation. You know, when, when someone in the group starts talking candidly and says, you know what, this works for me. And suddenly everyone in the room zooms their head around and, you know, and it becomes like a sponge. And, and we realized people are really starved. We were really starved for just sort of honest, candid talk about the topic. Um, and what struck us was that Doctors and experts tend to say everyone's different, as though that's the end of the discussion when it comes to what's pleasurable, as though we're just so wildly different, there's no use even, you know, thinking about it or asking friends about it, because what you like will be different from what they like. So just let it go and Mm. explore on your own. And, And in our friendship group, we realized that that wasn't true, that there were sort of variations on themes that some people liked for instance, um, really consistent touch, staying the same way just before orgasm, and they needed it to stay just exactly the same way. And other groups, uh, another part of the room said, no, for me, it has to be constantly surprising and different or else it gets sort of numb and stops being pleasurable. So we realized just in our friendship group that it's not true that we're just wildly randomly different. There are themes. And we went searching sort of in the research not in a work capacity, just curiosity, who's named these themes? Who's done research on it? And we found that scientific research about pleasure for the sake of pleasure and ways of enhancing pleasure just doesn't get funding. Um, Mm. So the information that's out there is often very seedy, you know, lists of tips made up on men's magazines and women's magazines and books of, you know, someone will say, well, I think this is how it works. And I think this is how it works. But there isn't a basis in fact from science. And that sort of angered us. And we thought, what if we did that research 
And um, so we partnered with researchers at Indiana University and the Kinsey Institute and did the first ever large scale um, scientific studies on, on the ways of touch that are pleasurable and why. And it snowballed into a, a big, big project that's been going on for some years now. That is so exciting. And I think what your point is, is that then most of the research comes, and we talked about this a little bit before the interview, from if there's a problem, we'll throw money at it, right? So if there's a sexual dysfunction or sexual issues, then there's, you know, a reason to have research. But pleasure of, in of itself, for pleasure's sake, has not been prioritized, which is so tragic. Right? Yeah. It's so sad. Yeah. So that's, did you have trouble finding funding or anything along those lines? I mean, how did you go about, because of that bias, how did you go about even getting the research started? Yeah, it turns out that individual researchers who you and I, you know, know from the conferences are excited about studying pleasure, but there's this sense that the journal reviewers or the people who issue grants or that someone up on high is going to say no. And the, the experience of being a sexologist or a sex therapist that we've heard again and again is you go to a party or you're meeting your, you know, your kid's parents, uh, kid's friend's parents, and they say, what do you do? And if it has to do with sex, often they think, oh, you know, do you have sex with people in your office? And it's like, no, 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 no. And frequently people resort to saying, I work with people who have, you know, spina bifida, or I work with orgasm among people who have been through trauma or anorgasmia. And if you couch it in dysfunction or problems, people go, oh, okay. And it legitimizes it as, you know, in, in our culture is sort of like, it's medical. That makes sense. It's not that mm. other kind of sex, that <laughs> the kind that makes us uncomfortable, the pleasure part. So we did find a bunch of allies who wanted to do this research and just couldn't in their current, you know, careers and tenure tracks and things like that. So we fund it and people's $39 one-time payment funds the next waves of research and it's sort of going on and on. And it's really exciting. That is, that is really exciting. So why don't we start off by you talking a little bit about why sexual pleasure has been, um, as your website says, in the shadows, right, for, for so long and, and some of the taboos that we're trying to fight as a culture. I know, you know, coming at it from a Mormon perspective, I can definitely talk about some of the, you know, issues that we still have. I mean, masturbation oftentimes or self-pleasure is seen as a sin or something that's inappropriate. At the same time, I've got couples on my couch all the time who, you know, where the husband and the wife are wanting to be more reliable partners in regards to offering sexual pleasure. And so they're oftentimes very excited about this resource. So do you just want to talk a little bit about kind of our history and why in your thoughts we tend to struggle as, as a country and lots of religious cultures tend to struggle with this as well within our country? Yeah, absolutely. It's actually global, which is interesting. So in Europe, and, and th this hasn't been done in, in other countries either, I think that when we're growing up, there's a tendency for, for, you know, it's one of the first things we discover that the, you know, the young person says, I might keep this to myself. You know, it feels, discovering sexual pleasure feels like it's quickly sort of told, parents usually say, you know, don't do that or do that privately if they're progressive parents. And there's this sense of shame and, you know, that it's, that it's not okay, that these desires aren't, aren't permissible. And when it doesn't get undone, there's no, you know, ritual when you turn 18 where, you, where your parents are, you know, you're sat down and you said, remember all that stuff we said? Sorry, now you can remove all that. That was just because you were young. It's actually a beautiful thing and it's going to get better over your lifetime as you learn more about it and explore it. And because that, you know, that discussion, is, as any parent knows, is, is really awkward to even have even talk about sex so it tends to that that sense that something's wrong about it or that it's shameful persists somewhere in us and it persists even among you know sex educators and teachers and people talking to a sexologist at a you know a kid's soccer game about what they do and we just sort of all contain this idea that it's it's that something about it is sort of wrong 
except for the fact that it's a main part of, of being in love. You know, it's one of the best parts of, of sharing a relationship with someone. And so we have these counterbalance, like it's wrong, but it's also good and, and good with our partner. And how do we sort of reconcile that? And so one of the ways is this notion that it should just be private. It should just be kept in the bedroom. You shouldn't read things about sex. You shouldn't talk about it which leaves couples sort of on their own without benefiting from the wisdom of others. You know, in, in all other domains, you know, cooking, for instance, we're all benefiting from the wisdom of past generations and past recipes and, you know, the best ways to cook this and cook that. But with sex, because it's so hush-hush, there's a lot of people just sort of refiguring it out together the hard way and getting frozen in the same sort of ways over and over, generation after generation. And we want to break that cycle. We think that we can benefit from the wisdom of others if we just have an open, honest, non-seedy, non-porny conversation about what feels good and what people wish they had known sooner. <laughs> non-porny. Sorry, you made me giggle. Yeah. So going back to the point you started with, you know, on the one hand, we have this kind of general idea that, yeah, everybody's different. Everybody experiences pleasure differently. Even on your website, you say things like, yeah, anatomy does vary and a few millimeters or a different angle of pressure or rhythm can make the difference, right, between discomfort and pleasure. I often talk about even timing, you know, so what feels good five minutes from now may not feel good, you know, 10 minutes from now, <laughs> depending on my level of arousal, et cetera. But then on the other hand, you're saying, no, there's patterns and themes and in general, maybe we can discover some basic ways that tend to be reliable. Do you want to talk about what you're finding out about that? What types of details you're able to share with us in yeah. that regard? Yeah. So, so we are studying men's pleasure too, by the way, and it's not, it's similar in the fact that the, the specifics haven't been researched or named, but anyways, yeah. So with, with women's pleasure, the experience tends to, of your users tends to be that, there hasn't been language or specific, you know, articulations of what they like or different ways of changing what they like. So people have a very vague notion of, I like that thing that my partner does. Well, what is it that they do? Or I like this thing. Could you do that thing you did? And one of the big realizations is that having words for, for what you like, specific words is really empowering. And it makes it legitimate. It's not your weird thing that you like. It's not, you're not alone with it. It's, you see on our site, for instance, you know, 65% of women also like this certain kind of teasing before touch of their clitoris. And they like it for an extended period of time. And if you see that and you see it's a legitimate thing, it's got a name, it's a, you know, it's shared by lots of people, it stops being stops feeling like a strange thing going out on a limb asking for it because mm -hmm. all these other people like it too. There's a name for it. You know, gosh darn it. I'm going to pursue this and ask for it. So that's sort of the, the net effect is by seeing these different themes, um, these different kind of prevalent ways that people discover they like pleasurable touch and, and having words for them, then you can talk about it and you can ask for it. And it's, a descriptive word, not a sort of urban dictionary slang word. It's not clinical. And Peggy Ornstein, this wonderful author, said, the way to make something truly unspeakable is to not name it. Mm. And that's part of what our culture has done around pleasure and the nuances of touch is by not giving them words, you make them literally unspeakable. And so we're trying to sort of enable a new kind of non-porny, non-clinical, you know, non-raunchy, but also non-doctor's office way of saying to your partner, I like this and this and this, and could you change what you're doing a little more like this? Does that make sense? Absolutely. And the naming part, you know, I, I talk often on the show about the importance of naming just even our anatomy, because especially for women, you know, in general, the word is vagina, which is the part of the anatomy that you don't really even get to see or interact with much. Um, I mean, you can a little, but 
you know, what you're really, if you're really going to look down there, you see your vulva, you see your labia, you know, you see your clitoris, you see your clitoral hood, you even see your perineum, you see your anus. We don't really talk about those types of body parts with young girls or even adolescent girls. In fact, my understanding is that, you know, sexual education in the United States doesn't even include the word clitoris because it's pleasure-based instead of reproductive-based organ. So yeah, that's, if we can't even, if we don't even know our own anatomy, that, I mean, how do we even talk about touching our anatomy? <laughs> right. Yeah. And the, the other sort of thing we're trying to overcome in culture is this notion that sex education is something for young people who don't know anything. Mm -hmm. um, that in fact, like cooking or like a sport or like anything else, any other domain in life, it's something that with more knowledge, it gets even better. Um, and that's true whether you're, you know, 18 and just learning or whether you're 45 and have been in a relationship or whether you're 65 and are discovering what's changed with menopause, that it's a mistake that our culture has sort of, and you know, instilled in us that you either know about sex or don't. We call it the myth of immaculate education, that the moment you turn sexually active, suddenly, somehow, you just know all of what's pleasurable to you and how to please a partner. And seeking out information about pleasure means that you're young and have a problem. And, you know, you'd never see a cookbook in a friend's house and think, oh, Sheila must have a cooking problem, you know, because <laughs> um, we, we all acknowledge, like, with more knowledge, there's, there's always more to discover and more to explore. So we really try to push that, that idea that we have breakthroughs throughout our life that make it make pleasure permanently better. Um, and often decades go by between those breakthroughs, but there's no reason for that. We can, we can have them now with some, some exploration and work with our partner. I love all your cooking metaphors. I've used <laughs> metaphors in the past myself, you know, that exactly like we watch shows, you know, we don't, we don't say, Oh, I'm, I'm now more addicted to cinnamon, right? Or something like that because I, uh, you know, I've watched it on a show and I've been influenced negatively because I didn't come up with that idea on my own or something like that, right? And so there is a lot of shame, I think, in this idea of knowledge to your point that somehow we're just supposed to know how to be good lovers or how to achieve orgasm or to have sexual pleasure in our lives and it's really unfortunate because I can't agree with you more in that sexuality should be more of an ongoing journey. And, and again, the education that we do provide is usually at a very young age. It's very reproductive focused and, you know, it'd be great to have more of this template of adult sexual education, you know, that we can continue to tap into over the span of our lifetimes for, for yeah. a variety of reasons, whether we're shifting with partners, or like you're saying, different developmental stages, different health concerns that come up, different just things that happen with age, getting to know ourselves and our bodies throughout our lives. I mean, that's just a wonderful way to, to approach that. Absolutely. We're, we're studying menopause and postpartum, because th those are domains that are very under-researched also when it comes to, to pleasure. And what we're finding is that people who go to their doctors with sexual concerns often report really ne you know, negative experiences or deficiencies or less pleasure, lower libido. But no one had asked in research, has anything gotten better until we, we've done some large-scale surveys? And it turns out that menopause, for instance, it's, it's almost as if some erogenous zones become less active and new ones become active. Mm. So it's actually a really hopeful finding that that it's a time to sort of re-sift what feels good. And new things feel good for a huge number of people. And it's just that that hasn't been part of the narrative. If you Google sex and menopause, it, it reads like a, like a disease with symptoms. You know? Like a death I, sentence yeah. of your sexuality. <laughs> yeah. And so what, what really counteracts that is seeing video of really relatable people clearly just telling their stories unscripted saying, you know what? I discovered this and this and this. And then another person seeing another video, I discovered this and this. And that's our sort of magic formula for combating 
these cultural myths is, is tr these truth telling videos of regular real people sitting on couches telling about their journeys and their breakthroughs because you really can't argue with someone telling their story. And if you see enough of them, you're like, well, that is a thing, you know, whereas reading a bullet point in a website about, you know, lots, this happens in menopause, you can be really skeptical. People are rightly skeptical about sex information because so much is just made up. But seeing video of relatable people who are vulnerable and just saying, this has been my experience, sort of gets in the wisdom door of the viewer and really changes people and changes perspectives. Yeah. And I want to get more into the product and the videos in a minute. Before we do that, I'd like to go back to your comments about language. Uh, you mentioned a few words just such as, you know, stimulation. That's kind of like a clinical yeah. term, yeah. maybe more pop culture terms are things like rubbing or fingering. And you see those as fairly inadequate. So can you give us some examples of the type of language that is more effective and more likely to have success for people? Yeah. So it turns out that, that couples making their own words is really helpful because it feels like a shared thing. You know, it, it's, it's our thing, not something we found. So our words that we provide on the site are more about here are the themes and isn't having words wonderful, but, you know, and now make your own. But for instance, something like Layering is the idea of indirectly touching the clitoris through surrounding skin, which is two thirds of women prefer indirect touch, meaning you know touch through the sides of the labia or through the clitoral hood or through fabric. And so that's just something that you don't see out there, but that the research revealed, you know, we interviewed a thousand people and surveyed another thousand and it just came up again and again and again. And so to be able to say, like we hear a lot that women say, every time what the feedback I give is just lighter. I just say, could you do that lighter? Could you do that lighter? But that's not specific enough for a partner. Because mm -hmm. you can still be directly touching the clitoris in a lighter way, and that's not necessarily what she's talking about. Right. So if you could say, could you layer through the hood? suddenly that's a different concept that is more actionable by the partner if they saw the site with you and they get that concept. And with one redirect, the partner can forevermore do the, you know, do the thing you like. Mm -hmm. So that's the hope is that, that just by equipping people with specific enough ways to, to conceptualize and explain what they like, that it's sort of a one and done thing with, with partners who are listening. And you can avoid sort of what we call the warmer, colder version of giving feedback, which is really nonspecific. Like, do you like that? No. Do you like that? No. Yeah, no. You know, that that's not, if you think of the fluency with which we guide someone who's scratching our back, if you have an itch, it's just so easy to say, nope, scratch a little lower. Nope, a little more towards my arm, a little higher, harder. Got it. Right. It just right. happened. There's no presumption that the back scratcher already is a master of back scratching. There's no, <laughs> there's no, you know, fumbling with words of how do I say higher? How do I, and obviously, you know, genitals are more complicated and so require some more complex words, but wouldn't that be wonderful if we were that fluent and that it was that uncharged and we could just guide our partners to what we like and be guided and, yeah, you know, that, that's what we're aiming for. Yeah, and that gets to another whole really important point that I don't know if you're spending much of your research on is this idea that the back scratcher now feels offended that they didn't scratch the back correctly to begin with. <laughs> I think a lot of times people are concerned that they're going to damage the ego of their partner or that, uh, or people actually do feel, you know, like a little attacked or inadequate if their partner is sharing things that they, they enjoy. Are you addressing that yep. at all as far as how to help people kind of get over that myth? Yes. So, so that's the number one reason given in, in our research for, for why people want to be touched differently and don't speak up is the fear of hurting the partner's feelings. Mm. With which, if you unpack that, uh, back to the immaculate education idea, men are put in this position that they, a good lover already knows what 
what their partner likes. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. If you think of the Hollywood movie, there isn't much talking and the lover just knows. And that that's a really harmful framing because it puts it puts both people in, in a really you know non-productive situation. And part of it is showing men that there is wide variety and that things that feel good for one person probably don't for another and that what feels good for one partner one day might not be the best thing the next day hour to hour stage to stage of arousal so that's one of the main benefits for men on omgs is using omgs is they see wow my move actually isn't you know the universal move and there's a thing called the touchable simulation in OMGS, which is a photoreal vulva, and it's programmed with a particular woman's mm -hmm. preferences. And the hope is that partners using it together, that the man will see, wow, my move is not universal and actually is painful for this simulated you know, person. And for the woman will be, wow, giving feedback is can be done in all these different ways that aren't a big confronting conversation. You know, it's not like, Herbert, we got to talk. I don't like what you've been doing all these years. It can be done in really tender, playful ways that the partner is receptive to. So that is a main, a main issue that we're trying to fix. That's fabulous. I, I just love so much of everything you're saying and why I refer to you often, as I said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So yeah, let's dive into the product itself. So what can people expect to find if, you know, once they hit the, the pay button, what, what types of things are you offering to help people get these types of resources? Yeah, so we publish papers, which are like journal articles and, and, and scientific publications that are really dense. And so the public doesn't really benefit from those. They've sort of got a language of their own. So the site, the omgs.com, is a way to turn that, the, all those insights into something that doesn't take a lot of time, is fun to go through, that hopefully gives you all the benefits of, of all these women's insight, 2,000 women and their, their wisdom. And so the, the format is the most prevalent sort of things that change things for people are presented sort of like chocolates in a chocolate box, like all these different techniques and concepts and you can just explore and go into any of them and each one has multiple different women's perspectives how they discovered it how it links to what they learned in their childhood and how they specifically do it and and each of these women is sort of like the the representative of a big chunk of the population that shares that insight so for instance in season 2 which is coming out in a few months one of the big themes is grinding, which is pressing, you know, a woman pressing her vulva against a surface, whether that's the bed or a bed post, which is a very prevalent way that, that people first discover pleasure. For me, it was and, a doll when I was like three. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what's interesting is how many people store that away as a secret private thing that somehow isn't okay because it was discovered in that period when, you know, you were afraid of getting caught or, you, you know, or being shamed by your parents, it's just sort of pushed into the recesses, isn't shared with a partner really often. And it's just the secret thing that you do that you feel ambivalent, you know, conflicted about. But seeing all these women say that and seeing statistics about how prevalent that is, and then seeing videos of women who have then integrated that into their partner sex and how wonderful that's been for them unlocks this whole it's a sense of relief you know like you're not alone this is a very prevalent thing it's got a name here's different variations on it it's not your weird little thing mm -hmm. and it's something to point to with a partner and say i do that as opposed to mustering up the courage to sort of explain from scratch mm -hmm. So, so these videos of these relatable people serve as sort of a, a conversation piece and as a, a way of discovering and benefiting from other people's realizations. And the statistics sort of help normalize it even further, that this really is 
a shared human experience. It's not just your thing and it's okay. And it's actually wonderful and celebrate it. And seeing older women saying that they just discovered something this last year, you know, reinforces that it gets better and better through a lifetime. And that's a good thing. And to, you know, we just want to sort of let pleasure off the hook. It's not frivolous. It's not selfish. It's a wonderful part of being alive and deserves our attention. And yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like a lot of the videos are dialogue. So like you said, women sitting on a couch, this is not nudity. This is fully dressed women just talking about their experiences. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of that because sort of hearing about, this is it's sort of like hearing about dance moves that you kind of have to see the, see it to understand the, the difference between the nuances of it. So the women. Oh, also, that, yeah. So how do you get to that part? That's, yeah. that's good, yes. So lower down on each page, there's also demonstration. So there's no partners, there's no men on the site, but these women sort of show on themselves, not in a ooh, ah, uh, sexy eye, way but in a very frank you know they're talking the whole time and saying so what i mean is it's pushing downward like this and it's pulling around like this and that's very new we're not so you can see their vulvas you can see their bodies you can see them demonstrating these things on their own on their on themselves correct yes yeah and And i just want to point out too for my audience that it's this is where i think it's so important to be able to and you've you've kind of talked about this language to decipher between, you know, quote unquote pornography, which tends to go against a lot of people's religious values versus sexual education, which is, you know, knowing about your anatomy, knowing about something that will really edify and benefit your relationship with your spouse, your partner, and, um, and therefore can be very much, you know, and it's not in secret, you can do this with your partner, like he's talking about. So this is not about, you know, doing something that is going to somehow make you feel unworthy or, you know, less spiritual in some way. So sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. No one confuses it for pornography when you see it. You know, it's a, it's a very poor substitute for pornography if that's what someone was looking for. It's, it's, it's very much um, like sitting with a bunch of friends over wine and talking for a long while, and then people show what they mean. When, only when it's motivated, you know, when, when, When you can get it from someone showing something on their hand or on their knuckle, then that suffices. But if you have to see it to to understand it, people show it. And it's a sort of, we call it no blushing, no shame. There's, it's a sort of open, honest way of demonstrating. And that sort of, again, creates a model for people like, wow, it's possible to be this okay about this stuff. It's, It's sort of aspirational that these women are, are, you know, this articulate about what they like, and it shows that that's possible. And people talk about their journeys and how hard it was to, to become that comfortable with, with, you know, explaining and showing what they like. And yeah. Yeah, that's really wonderful. And was I correct in, in hearing that you also have like an app or something that people can use on their own smartphones? Yeah, so there's a in season one that which, so that we do the research in waves every few years. There's a new season. The second season's coming out soon. In season one, which is a lot about external clitoral stimulation and the ways that varies, we wanted to show people how different women give feedback, sort of in the moment feedback, like no, sort of like back scratching, you'd say a little higher, a little towards the left. But how do you do that when it comes to someone touching a vulva? And that kind of talk isn't modeled anywhere like it's not it's not out there it's not in movies it's not in podcasts it's not in pornography and we thought that was important to sort of to close the loop and show that you can sort of guide your partner in these ways and the best way to show that is actually to give someone that experience so whether you're a partner or a woman you can sort of interact with these photoreal vulvas programmed with the voice and preferences of that particular woman. And she gives you feedback in a non-sexy, you know, not in a, 
ooh, do that sort of way. But right. in really frank, descriptive, like, no, more, you know, more downstroke, a little less like that. Yeah, kind of like that, but it needs to be this. And it, it sort of shows and models like this doesn't need to ruin the mood. This doesn't need to be a big conversation. You don't need to say, hey, partner, I don't like what you've been doing. It's possible to just sort of guide people. And, and here are, you know, 12 different women's models of doing that. That is fascinating. So even as they interact with their finger on the screen, you can, the, the screen will actually pick up on different pressure and different ways that you're moving your finger. Is that correct? Yeah. It's like with each, each lesson, within each page, the woman is guiding you to understanding that lesson. And there's no orgasm at the end. It's not a game where you make her orgasm. At the end, she goes, yep, that's what I meant by edging. Or, yep, you got it. That's accenting. Or, yep, that's layering, which is a tough concept. Some people, you know, it's, it sounds sort of like a little bit shocking. And there is a, a lump in everyone's throat when you see, you know, photo real vulvas, because we're so programmed in this culture to associate that with, you know, wrong. It's wrong. But it's not wrong when we, you know, see our partner's anatomy or see our own anatomy. And, this is more in, in, in that domain. This is the domain of love and, and trying to make pleasure better, not in the sort of wanting to see media to arouse us. So that's really the, the sort of revolution is that that's possible. I think this is fascinating. I think this is such a, a wonderful hands-on approach. You know, like you said, sex therapists were not necessarily in the business of showing people (laughs) or getting into their bedrooms or um, because it's not part of our our licensed work. There are, I think, you know, sexual surrogates and people who might be willing to do that. But again, it's not always from a clinical perspective and, you know, evidence-based, research-based work. So this to me just seems like a really, like there really isn't any other resource out there like this. So how do you feel about just kind of being a pioneer in this groundbreaking type of technology and how tell me more about your team and what what are you all up yeah. to so so what really we're excited about is doing this same model in other areas of life so the overall model is that willa cather uh, once said there are really only two or three human stories and they go on repeating themselves as fiercely as though they've never happened before and it's this notion that every generation we're all sort of repeating the same stories, but there's some parts of life where we're not benefiting from each other's wisdom. And so can we sort of gather and encapsulate the wisdom of, you know, the collective wisdom and put it into a format that, that gives that wisdom to people. So we're doing that season one of OMGS is about clitoral stimulation, but it extends to, you know, what about the things in parenting? There's a lot of things after you have a baby where suddenly the attention shifts to the baby and there's not a lot of stuff about dealing with the tear and about self-care and not going nuts as a new mom or as a new dad. So we're making a whole resource in a similar, this similar sort of wisdom sharing research-based way about what we're calling the sort of fourth and fifth trimester. And we're doing another one about men's sexual pleasure. And we're doing another one about menopause. So the team is split up into these sort of work groups who are all doing research with different professors on these different other topics um, and building out what are the insights and casting really relatable people for the videos. So we're, we're very excited to be able to sort of extend this model into more and more areas. Season two of OMGS is going to be about internal stimulation, which is also mythical and misunderstood. So we're busting a lot of myths in that, and and that'll be really useful to people. So we're just we're just amped that in- internal stimulation, meaning vaginal stimulation. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. Wonderful. That sounds amazing. So tell me then who best benefits from this? Like, what are you noticing as far as users? So is this a lot of couples? Because I can think of you know, women just on their own, wanting to explore their own bodies, finding their own sexual capacity for pleasure. 
I can see men watching this on their own, like just wanting to know more about female anatomy and, and upping their own abilities to have different techniques and language to offer, whether they're in a current partnership or not, if they're heterosexual. I can see couples doing this together. Like, so what, what are you yeah. noticing? Do you have a way to keep track of who's yeah. using it and how? Yeah, so it's, it's a lot of women using it alone, women using it in friendship groups. So it sort of forms a, a way to be closer with friends to, to broach these topics and, and get beyond the, like, the general notion of like, it's very normalizing and feels really good to, to talk about this with people. So it's a great conversation piece sort of with book clubs among friends. A lot of doctors and OBs are recommending it to their patients and clients. Some men are using it. Originally, it was a lot more, but it's sort of taken off among women. Men, unfortunately, in our culture, you know, there's the old saying, men don't ask for directions. There's this, this idea that, that you, sh- you shouldn't need help, you know, that, that among American men, you know, that learning more implies that you don't know enough. And that's a real, that's something we're going to have to hedge off. And, you know, we're also working on something for adolescents that's basically designed to counteract that notion that a good male lover already knows what the partner likes. And so that's unfortunately a, a bigger, a bigger nut to crack. Couples use it together. We're often a woman will use it herself and figure out which thing she likes and then be able to point to the partner and say, watch this video and this video. And that takes a lot of weight off of having to start from scratch and explain. People watch it together, sort of like instead of a Netflix night. So lots of uses. That's, yeah, it's phenomenal. And what type of feedback are you getting as far as is this helping women have more satisfaction in their sexual relationships? Is there an uptick on, for example, women who haven't necessarily been able to experience or know how to experience orgasm and now they have? Like, do you have any follow-up research? Yeah, we're doing um, an efficacy study with Indiana University School of Medicine where a thousand users do a survey at the beginning, pretty extensive, and then we track how much they use the site and then they do a survey at the end. And that's in in progress right now, but the early results are are really positive. With in terms of orgasm, one of our goals is to remove the idea that orgasm is the goal because that can be it can actually get in the way of of a lot of people's pleasure and put a lot of pressure. And some people don't have conventional orgasms, and so a lot of people feel broken if they don't orgasm a certain way. So we try to undo that cultural notion that orgasm is the be all. And if you're orgasming, it's as good as it can get. If you're not, there's something wrong. But yeah, so more, more pleasure, more playful, sort of sex between partners, more relationship happiness. We're seeing more optimism is one of the measures that sexual optimism, that things are going to get better and better as opposed to the notion that this is as good as it can get. So, you know, there are lots and lots of factors that when that paper comes out, will We'll be more prepared to to talk about those benefits. That's wonderful. And had you mentioned something to me prior to us actually recording that that you have a an actual group of Mormon, either women or users that are giving feedback as well? Or you mentioned yeah, in the there's a Facebook post that has a whole group of. I mean, one one of the benefits of the site is that it sort of brings these things out of the shadows and makes them it's okay to talk about. And so there's, you could try to find it. There's a, a group saying, sort of talking about how, you know, what their parents used to, used to call their vulva, you know, someone said it it was a dirty cookie or, you know, my parents called it this and, and just sort of, it, it seems like a, a refreshing thing to come out of this sort of judgment, shame based cultural framing and share their experience and things that often you've never told anyone, but to hear other people say it and feel that relief of like, wow, I'm not alone. I don't have the the Mormon thread up in front of me right now, but it was a bunch of people saying, oh my gosh, me too. This Mm -hmm. is what my parents said. Oh my gosh, me too. 
And, and are these groups that people can join just publicly or you need to be a subscriber to be able to access or do you even know? Like, do you, are these groups that you're controlling somehow or just people just kind of come up with their own groups? This is actually comments on a Facebook post, which I can send I you. And okay. you, could, you could post it on your site and your users can just go to it free and, and see these comments. So I'll send it to you after we talk and you can maybe post it on your site and uh, people can see. Okay, can see. that'd be great. Yeah. yeah. That'd be great. All right. I know we're coming towards the end of our time. You've given us amazing information. What am I not asking or talking about that you want to make sure you get to cover today? Uh, I, I just think generally that the research shows that, that we each have breakthroughs over the course of our life, over our lives, that a breakthroughs about what our bodies are capable of doing. And, and those happen not usually because we're searching them out, but they just sort of slap us in the face. We just discover these things. But those breakthroughs happen decades apart. And it's so easy to, to just go into default mode and use the techniques and the ways of interacting with our partner that we've been using and to not rock the boat. But it's so worth it to explore this and to, to love that part of ourselves and, and to explore and discover and and you can have those breakthroughs now based on the wisdom of others who have who have been through the woods you're you're going through and so i just encourage everyone to to stay curious and to and to and to be loving to this part of ourselves that gets so neglected that our parents and our culture put down but that is actually you know good and a wonderful part of being in love and part of being alive well, amen to all of that. You can find all of this information on omges.com. And just to second what you just said, I mean, sexuality is part of our health. You know, yeah. it's there's so many actual health benefits to uh, having a sex positive and pleasure centric relationship with your sexuality. So I think people like yourself and like me, that's one of our big goals, right? Is to help people go down those roads, even though we throw our parents under the bus a lot they also dealt with their own sexual shaming messages and that's why they pass yeah. them along. These are intergenerational issues. Uh, it's not that it's anybody's fault necessarily. It's just, these are millennia of messages that we're all kind of trying to combat and we're making some really great progress. I'm excited about that. I hope that everybody can feel hopeful about these kinds of concepts in their own lives. And, and again, I just want to thank you so much, Rob, for your time. I mean, this has been amazing for you to spend an hour with us. I so appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. minutes into miles And as the evening traveled on The sunset bathed your smile We stopped beneath the desert stars Wrapped in each other's arms Was as simple as I love you An ordinary, extraordinary truth It's been a long road here A trail If sometimes we fell apart, we always came back home. Was as simple as I love you, an ordinary, extraordinary.
Some people say, people say love is blind and forever is too long. But I see your eyes in every sunrise. Can't imagine life alone. Watch you by my side till the day I die and into the beyond. It's as simple as our love is. That's how I wanna go. All wrapped up in the arms. Extraordinary. It's nothing hard to marry love. Ordinary. Ordinary. No, it's extraordinary. 